As we learned in class this week, the discipline of philosophy is concerned with asking hard questions and using arguments in order to think about them rationally and objectively. So if we're gonna to learn to do philosophy, we are gonna to need to learn a little bit more about what arguments are and about how they work. We are gonna begin with some of the most important concepts to understand about arguments. In particular, in this course, there are six key argument concepts that I'm going to expect all of you to understand and be able to apply before the end of the semester. And I'm gonna break them into two groups of three. The first group of three concepts are the concepts of soundness, validity, and formal validity. And what these three concepts have in common is that they are all nice things to say about arguments. I mean, in the sense of being compliments, it is a good thing for an argument to be sound, valid, or formally valid. And these contrast with bad things that we can say about arguments, that they're unsound, invalid, or formally invalid. Whenever this semester we want to say that an argument is good, we're going to characterize it as being sound, valid, or formally valid. And whenever we want to criticize it, we're going to use the contrary terms. In particular, we are never going to say that an argument is true or false, logical or illogical, or that it makes sense. The most important concepts we're going to be interested in is the concept of soundness. It's such an important concept that I'm going to refer to it as the gold standard for arguments throughout the semester. And it's this soundness that we're going to focus on in this first video. The next three argument concepts that we need to introduce are the concepts of a premise, a conclusion, and an intermediate conclusion. What these three concepts have in common is that they are all parts of an argument. The most important parts of an argument are the concepts of a premise and a conclusion. We're going to focus on these two concepts and what follows. Intermediate conclusions are a topic we're going to take up in a later video. So now that I've hopefully piqued your curiosity about these argument concepts, it's time that we can dig in. Since every argument tries to establish something that we didn't already know, we can write that below the line and we can characterize it as the conclusion of the argument. In general, the conclusion of an argument is a sentence. For example, if we're trying to establish the conclusion that George is a monkey, then our conclusion is that George is a monkey. In addition, every argument is going to have some number of premises, which are sentences that we're taking for granted in trying to establish our conclusion. Whereas every argument has exactly one conclusion, arguments will vary in the number of premises, each with some number or other. For example, we've already written down an argument with zero premises. That counts as an argument. But if we don't know anything about George, and we don't know anything about monkeys, then we'll have a hard time drawing this conclusion. And so a better argument might start with another assumption about George. For example, that George's parents are monkeys. And this assumption does seem to be the right kind of thing to convince us that George is a monkey. It's enough to persuade me at any rate. But unfortunately, it's not enough to persuade my skeptical Uncle Larry. Uncle Larry's a skeptic, and he wonders whether monkeys are like lawyers. Many people have parents who are lawyers, but aren't lawyers themselves. So to convince my Uncle Larry, we're going to need to assume something else. We'll need to assume that if George's parents are monkeys, then George is a monkey. Now our argument has two premises, but it doesn't matter what order we write our premises in. So let's practice seeing that it doesn't matter by writing them in the other order. Even though it doesn't matter what order premises are in, sometimes we give premises names, like P1 and P2 for premises, and C for the conclusion. At last, we've written down an argument that is sound. That is, it satisfies what I've called the gold standard for arguments. Sound arguments satisfy two criteria. They're formally valid, and they have all true premises. Let's take these two criteria in order. You may recognize formal validity as one of the three main compliments that we can pay to arguments from the beginning of this video. We will focus more on exactly what formal validity is, how it's to be defined, and how to assess whether arguments are formally valid in a later video. For now, what's important to understand about formal validity is that it gives us an answer to my Uncle Larry. If an argument is formally valid, then Uncle Larry has no way to resist the conclusion so long as he accepts the premises. This shows that there are only two ways to criticize an argument as not meeting the gold standard of soundness, by showing that it's not formally valid 
but that it has at least one false premise. Let's apply that to the case of our argument. Premise one of our argument said that George's parents are monkeys. That's true. Premise two said that if George's parents are monkeys, then George is a monkey. Again, true. Everyone whose parents are monkeys is a monkey. The conclusion of the argument is that George is a monkey. This argument, I'm just going to tell you, is formally valid. We'll see more about formal validity later. But for now, we've seen the gold standard of soundness, and we're ready to think more about arguments.